having me. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be a closing act of this amazing day. Um, so yeah, the talk is called You Might Not Need Blank, and uh, there isn't that much of a talk, so we hopefully we'll be able to get through it quite quick, and I uh, wouldn't hold you from the beer too much longer. All right. There are a lot of rules that govern our behavior. Many of those rules were created to manage constraints. A lot of those constraints that those rules were created to manage aren't there anymore. Following these rules can and actually, as an industry, stops us from getting to a better future. Thank you all for listening. I will now take questions. A gentleman in the back. Oh, um, that's a tough one. Oh, don't worry. Uh, we don't need to give you a mic. Uh, I can repeat the question. Uh, the question was, do you have like, I don't know, example of something? <laughs> Did I get your question right? Yeah, okay. Um, geez, you really threw a curveball for me. Um, all right, let's go through an example. Let's go to the beginning. And I don't mean the beginning of the world, I mean the beginning of computers or software being used commercially, right? Straight after the time where the computers were primarily used for military or for scientific research, the time when the computers became something that is interesting for commercial distribution, commercial solutions. One of the most interesting periods in time where the software actually began, uh, gained its strides was in 1964s uh, onwards to 1970s. Uh, there was a lot of large-scale manufacturing organizations that started adopting software and started adopting very interesting manufacturing techniques in order to gain market advantage. One of the most notable companies of that era uh, that kind of gained a really high prominence in 70s, 80s, was a company called Black & Decker, which is a manufacturer of power tools, you know, like drills and hammers and stuff like that. Um, and there is a really, really good article that describes what happened with them, the transition that they went through. And basically, it's a, it's a fundamental shift in their entire operation. Over the span of a, of a, of a decade, they went from being a, a f one of many manufacturers of power tools to being the market dominant leader in that area, right? And there's a really good article on the Harvard Business Review uh, from 1985 that describes the entire transition and the process. And it's an interesting read for multiple reasons. One of them is that if you read that article, you read and find terminology like improvements in the lead time or reductions in the lead time, just-in-time delivery, Kanban. And I remind you, this is an article from 1985 about the thing that happened with the company in 1970. Black & Decker went from one of the many to being the market leader, right? And they used a lot of those practices, just in time, Kanban. But in the software center of the entire transition was one technology. And that technology was called MRP, or Material Requirements Planning. Now, for many of you and for myself, I wasn't even born in that day, in that time. So I had to research of what it was, because the term was completely meaningless to me. I am aware of ERPs, but MRPs is something different. So MRPs were precursors to ERPs. MRPs, or Material Requirements Planning, is, is a software for manufacturing or factories that focuses on a much, much smaller scale problem. What they try to do is they try to automate the shop floor, right? The, which is a small subsection of a factory. And what the shop floor does in factories, is fundam it fundamentally tries to answer a simple question, which is how much material should we order from a vendor to produce the, uh, to produce the products that we are selling to our customers? Right? Because the way it works is like, as you can imagine, whenever Black & Decker builds a drill, it's not that they produce all the wood and all the metal in-house, right? They place off the web of orders to other manufacturers that produce nuts and bolts and then send them over. So there's an inter interconnected web of calculations that need to happen for them to build you a drill and send it to you, right? And the, the, the people responsible for that calculation is a shop floor. MRP is the system that was optimizing or automating it. 
And Black & Decker was riding the wave of being the first one to the market with that and being the, the one that actually gets the biggest benefit out of it. Which then followed by a very slow uh, period of adoption from 65 to 80s. Uh, by the 75, by the middle of 70s, there were 700 companies that followed Black & Decker, and all of them reported the sim similar results, right? Huge improvements in their market value, uh, huge improvements in their lead time, ability to disrupt their competitors. And obviously from this point onwards, it started ramping up, and by the beginning of 80s, there was already 8,000 companies that either started or already were in the middle of a process of implementing MRPs into their business. And as with any large-scale adoption, um, obviously there was a lot of non-successes at this point, right? And a lot of negative buzz started forming. The tool wasn't working for some of the companies to the level that people were expecting. For some of the companies, there was a buzz that it might not be working altogether. And that small buzz, that small negative sentiment, transformed into something large, larger, much bigger by the middle of 80s. Uh, something that I call a big disillusionment in the MRP systems. Turns out, majority of those 8,000 companies didn't see the results that the early adopters on the 700 companies saw. In many, many instances, not only did, did, they not, did they not see the results, the positive results, they actually saw drawbacks. The costs increased, they didn't get any additional revenue, and the question started arising of what is going on. And as with anything in industry, they don't have time on, of overanalyzing, so they moved out to the greener pastures, to the new shiny thing, and for decades, there wasn't any thought or conclusive answer of what went wrong with MRPs. Until a um, famous Eliyahu Goldratt of the, the goal and the theory of constraint fame came up not only with a plausible answer of what went wrong, but also with a framework that we can use together to work out what might have went wrong. And that framework is a very simple series of four questions. And the questions are, what is the main power of the technology, MRP in this case? What limitation does this technology diminish when implemented? What rules help us accommodate the, this existing limitation before we implemented it? And what rules should we use now instead? So let's use MRP and go through those one by one. What is the main power of technology? Well, this is the simplest one to answer in any context. Uh, it's usually, you take the marketing booklet of the technology and it will be written right there. Or you find the first salesman of the technology and they will tell you straight away, what is the biggest advantage of, of uh, MRPs? Interdependent calculations and speed. Well, as I, as I told you, uh, shopping floor and net requirements, which is a problem that this automates, is in effect a lot of very small, fairly simple calculations, but they're all interdependent. MRPs as, a soft, as any software system can do it at a scale and at a speed. Well, what is the limitation that MRPs diminish or remove? And the limitation is time to calculate net requirements, right? Because if, if you go back in history and you read what transpired there, in the middle of 70s, for a plant or a factory of 300 people, you needed a, a team of around 20 accountant level calculators, human calculators, that needed to sift through all of the orders and generate the subsequent orders for all the vendors, right? And it's a usually very stupid basic calculations, but it's a time-consuming process that they needed to do. And obviously, because it's a time-consuming process, they couldn't do it all the time. So what was the rule that they used to mitigate the limitation or accommodate the limitation? Well. You will be surprised, but there is no written rule on how and when to do those, well, when to do those calculations in particular. But if you look back in 60s or 50s, all of the factories across the world almost like agreed implicitly to do those calculations once a month, right? And it kind of makes sense because, again, it's a boring stuff. It's a large team. It requires two to three days to go through. Doing it more often will require more staff and will require a larger investment than to actually produce the goods that people paid you for, right? So monthly calculation totally made sense. But now, with MRP, 
what rules should we do instead? Well, MRP is a software system that you can run overnight. It's back in the 70s, so you can't run it all, like in real time. But you could run it overnight and do an entire calculation, right? And that's the advantage that Black & Decker and those early 700 companies used. So think about it. From the market perspective, if you're placing an order for a bunch of drills from Black & Decker before the implementation of MRP, at best, the thing that you can hope for is that your drills will arrive one month from now. At worst, if you, play it, if you place your order at the wrong moment, your drills will arrive two months from now. But now, Black & Decker, because they're able to do this vendor calculation more often, they can shrink the time it takes them to deliver your orders. They can shrink it from one month to two weeks to a week, in some cases two days. And at that point, customers would never go to their competitors and wait for two months for delivery of their products. They will go to Black & Decker. And that's how Black & Decker and the rest of those 700 early adopters gained the results, the benefits that they gained commercially. That's how they gained the market advantage. Now, the most amazing thing is that if you go back in history and you read information about the early adoptions and what companies did, guess what? 8, majority of those 8,000 companies do after they implemented the MRP. They kept running their calculations monthly, right? So they had a process where they would roll a calculation of their net requirements once a month. They installed this very complex software system that can run it overnight, but their rules were still that they will run it only once a month. So on the surface, the only thing that actually changed for that business is that instead of having 20 people, now they have a software system that does this once a month. And today I would say, well, maybe they saved cost. But in the 70s, that was a hell of an expensive system to run. So a lot of them actually lost money on running that system in comparison with just using 20 people. And that realization helped Eliyahu Goldratt to coin one of the famous benefit rules. And that is that technology can bring benefit if and only if it diminishes a limitation, right? The benefit of technology doesn't come with the power of technology. The benefit of technology comes with you replacing the previous rules and you actually seeing the limitation gone. Okay, how is this relevant to this talk whatsoever or this conference? Well, I think there is a plenty of areas that are applicable to this rule set, but in particular, there's two technologies that we use a lot, or two sets of technologies that we use a lot, that if we apply this analysis, I bet we will see interesting results. And those technologies are cloud computing and commodity solutions. So let's start with cloud computing. So cloud computing uh, is basically your digital oceans, AWS, as an early stage development, and then the second generation cloud platforms as a further development. So what is the main power of technology? Well, again, go to the AWS website or DigitalOcean website, and you will see that flexibility, scalability, and reliability out of the box is the power of that technology. But what is the limitation that cloud computing diminish? And it's fairly simple if you think about it. It's time to do a deployment, right? If you go back and you think about the times when we didn't have cloud computing, even before the times where we could develop, deploy our websites through FTP upload, what was the only way we could deploy a website or put an application into our customers' hands? Well, we had to buy a server, like a physical server. We had to provision it. We had to put it in a place that is accessible from the internet. And when you ha we had to register it thoroughly. And that takes a lot of time. And obviously, when you just need to update an application, it takes less time, but not that much less time. But obviously, we did deploy applications before, right? So it's not like we never deployed applications before the cloud. What rules helped us accommodate the limitation before? Well, that we had a dedicated ops team. Every single large organization has a team that is solely dedicated and have heavy investment into ahead of the time, buying, provisioning, and managing the servers. So whenever the need within the business arises, hopefully, 
there is a server that we can deploy this application into. It doesn't quite often work like that, but sometimes it does. And that's how we survived with this limitation before cloud. Right? Heavy investment into custom management scripts, custom deployments, custom man management of those servers. But now we have a cloud. What should we do instead? Well, we should do no ops. We should reduce the, no the amount of operations we have to do to deploy our application to the point where any developer can do it. Now, not to train every single developer to do ops. No, reduce amount of ops required. And if you look at the market and you look what people are actually doing, it's quite interesting because we're jumping into this cloud. People register their AWS accounts. People register their Google Cloud accounts. And their dedicated ops team starts setting up their virtual machines, starts setting up their, set, uh, their firewalls, their rules, like it's a physical server, right? So we still act like either, either mentally or physically that there is a dedicated ops team. So the time to deployment is still months or years. You still go through the rounds and rounds of approval. And three key areas that I, where I see this materializing is that, one, usage of AWS. This one is interesting. I don't think AWS is an application development platform. As in, if you're an application developer, if you develop applications, AWS is not a platform for you. AWS is a platform for platform developers, right? The easiest thing to, the way to think about it is, uh, think of AWS like you would think of Arduino or Raspberry Pi, right? Which is a series of components that you can use to create your custom computer. Which is totally fine if you want to create your custom computer. If you need to edit your Excel spreadsheet, you wouldn't buy Arduino components so that you can create your custom computer so that you can install Windows so that you can, right? You would just grab a laptop that is available next desk. AWS is a platform to allow platform developers build a platform for you. AWS is not a platform for you to run your applications on. Kubernetes is not an application platform either. Kubernetes is a platform to allow run Docker containers for people who are interested in running Docker containers. I'm not interested in running Docker containers, I'm interested in running applications. Some of those applications are in Docker containers, but I couldn't be more or less interested in running Docker containers themselves, right? There are companies who specialize and want to focus on running Kubernetes clusters. There is a world of difference between running Kubernetes cluster and running an application. AWS Lambda is also not an application development platform. AWS Lambda is an Arduino for serverless, right? If you want to build serverless platform, you use AWS Lambda like many companies already did. But if you, need, if you need to run a Lambda application or service application, you use one of those platforms that those people built. So for example, if you have a fixed stack that you need to deploy, and that stack is, doesn't change that much, so an example would be a fixed framework like Rails, Symfony, Laravel, or just use Heroku, or many of the customized services that pop up, like Symfony Cloud or uh, Laravel Vapor very soon. Now, if you want more flexibility and control over your environment, you still can use Docker container. Docker containers are, are very powerful tools for app developers, but you don't need Kubernetes cluster to run them. Heroku, Nanobox, there's many other platforms that announce their proposition for images. Heroku has proposition now where you can just have your Docker file, generate a Docker image, push it to them like it's a dyno, and they will run it like it's a dyno. You don't need to worry about scaling. You don't need to worry about how those things integrate into the, into the larger platform and how to secure them. And if you need to host a static site or uh, a stateless site, well, don't use AWS Lambda. Just use Netlify, ZeitNow, or any of the service services that companies built on top of AWS Lambda that make it so much simpler for you to just integrate with it, make the, the dream of no-ops possible. 
Now, some of you might be familiar with the framework, deployment frameworks for serverless, right? Like Cloudia JS serverless framework or Sound from Amazon that make it super simple to deploy your first uh, AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Engine uh, Lambda application. The one thing you need to keep in mind is that although they do take away the deployment setup, they never take away the management of it, right? And they kind of ease you into this false sense of security because, oh, like, I didn't configure anything. It's just a single YAML file that I wrote. But that YAML file results in them creating a multitude of services in your, AW in your personally owned AWS account. And if something goes wrong with any of those services, it's not their responsibility. It's yours. So the bottom line here is if you're an application developer, don't build on AWS, Kubernetes, or Lambda. They are the first generation platforms for platform developers. Now, does it mean never use it? No, use it if your problem requires a bespoke problem. Hint, hint, most problems do not, especially if you're in the early stages of solving it. And that is because distribution, resilience, and scaling are still very hard problems. Don't make them your problems. At least not straight away. Well, unless, unless you're certain that you can solve them better than Amazon and Heroku combined, right? Then sure, yeah. Another way to think about it is AWS, Kubernetes, and Lambda are part of your application stack in exactly the same way like your motherboard or CPU are. Remember the last time you spoke with you directly connected to your CPU and sent instructions as part of your Rails application or your Laravel application? More con controversially, I would say configuring Kubernetes cluster for a single web app is like designing a bespoke networking protocol so that you can share a single GIF. And we do this all the time, right? We use this excuse of designing for the future. It's like, oh, like, I know, like, we don't have this problem right now, but in the three years' time, we will have this problem. Well, guess what? Platform holders and the platform developers are way better at solving the problems of the future than you will ever be. So leave it to them. All I'm trying to say is seek better platform abstractions managed by somebody else. Don't just seek abstractions that hide the complexity away from you but not the management. Seek somebody who you can pay safely and they will be responsible for keeping this thing up. All right, what about commodity solutions? Well, first, what, I do, what do I mean by commodity solutions? I mean the solutions to the problems that were solved five million times already. Most of those solutions are on NPM. Commodity solutions are your CMSs, your e-commerce frameworks, your Drupals, your Magentos, your WordPresses, right? Or, more importantly, in the modern age, your Contentfuls, your Prismics, your software as a services, right? Every single business is full of problems that were solved five million times already. We're not interested in resolving the same problems. We're interested in solving the new ones. So commodity solutions is what allows us to not to focus on the problems that are specific to our business and let the problems that are generic and shared be managed by somebody else. So what is the main power of technology? Well, you read any of the CMSs or Adobe e-commerce and they will tell that their power is in rich, extensible API that allows you to extend the thing from both internal and, and externals. They also have advanced, advanced management UI that allows you to, that allows your non-technical stakeholders to manage the system without your advice or oversight. Well, what limitation do those technologies diminish? In my opinion, it's quite simple. It's the time to fulfill a need via an existing solution. You have a need that has an existing solution. How long will it take you to give that solution into the hands of, the, of your users, right? If you think about it, off the shelf, I need a CMS, I need to be able to manage a content. In ideal world, you have a contentful, you register an account, you create an account for your content manager, that's it, right? But if you look back a couple years, it wasn't an ideal world. Not everybody was in the cloud. The applications were on the intranet. So we had to deal with it. So what rules did we apply to accommodate this limitation before? Well, we used on-prem deployment of, of some general solution that is heavily vetted by the organizational IT team and their security team and their ops team, right? 
And it's usually like one, one of the open source solutions or a vendor solution like Adobe eCommerce Cloud. Um, it's very hard to get in, especially if it's an open source solution. Uh, you can go through hells and rounds and rounds of discussions with your IT and security team, sometimes taking half a year, sometimes a year of just you know, agreeing that it's okay to get this open source thing called Drupal into your infrastructure. And once you win and you get that thing in and you resolve your problem of you know, uh, your company needing to share their news on the website, suddenly the, the next problem, the next solved problem arrives, which is, you know, oh, we also need to send some apparel on our website. And what do you do? Do you go through the entire six months to one year process of getting another solution? And no, you already have Drupal, right? I don't want to go through this process. Let's just find a Drupal e-commerce plugin and plug it in. So that single general solution starts growing. But now, as all of our applications slowly migrate into the cloud, what should we do instead? Well, use solutions provided by third party that are managed by the third party. Simply said, software as a service, right? Use Contentful, use Prismic. Just use off-the-shelf solution that somebody else not only will de develop, but manage for you. But again, that's not what happens. What, you, what I see a lot is I, I interact with the teams that would have their own AWS account in the public cloud. They will have their own Kubernetes cluster running on EKS with their own Drupal instance running in one of the Docker containers on that, right? And it's like they operate like it's an on-prem hardware, hardware problem. It's because they didn't change the rules. And that generates this issue where our problems are overwhelmed with those general solutions. And there's a couple of problems that I see with this. One obvious and, and three less obvious. The obvious one is obviously if you, sorry, if you have a general solution, there's only one way the complexity of that solution can go up. It can only increase in complexity, it will never decrease. If you have one code base that you keep adding in, it can only become more complicated and complex. But then there's three less of this reasons to not go this route. One is uh, general solutions are generally average. So if you think about it, Drupal, and I'm not trying to, to dig into Drupal, by the way. WordPress, Magento, it doesn't matter. Any off-the-shelf open source or commercial solution will go through the same situation. But I'll say we have a Drupal. Um, and let's say you have a need for an e-commerce solution and you bring Drupal plugin for an e-commerce solution. Now, that could be the best in class e-commerce solution for Drupal. See what I did there? Any Drupal plugin has a responsibility to be a Drupal plugin first and then best in class whatever solution second, right? And then on average, if you take enough of those solutions, on average, you're at best average but in worst case scenario, you wouldn't even get your solutions, your problems solved fully, right? And that is because a lot of those plugin, plugins need to be and are more interested in being Drupal plugins or WordPress plugins or Magento plugins than they are to be best in class e-commerce experience, period. Second problem with this is that you're effectively outsourcing the development, but you're completely insourcing the maintenance of those systems. Sure, somebody else develops WordPress for you. Sure, there is a community that develops Magento. But as soon as you install it on, into your Docker container, it's now your responsibility to apply all the bug fixes, all the security fixes. And I'm not only talking about WordPress itself. I'm talking about every single plugin that you install, all the version conflicts. Because as soon as this thing goes down, your stakeholders wouldn't go to WordPress. They will go to you. And on a very high, like, very high level, on the surface, I can almost say that there isn't that much difference between a hairy two-year-old brownfield project and, bring, and bringing Drupal with a, a ton of custom plugins plus your own bespoke plugins into the greenfield. In both cases, you're taking on maintenance of a really large scale code base. And perhaps the least obvious reason is that you're burning the environment by utilizing the solutions like that, they're off the shelves. So 
the environmental issues, and I, by the way, I'm not talking about the production versus staging environment, I'm talking about the environment that we're all living in. The environmental issues are, like, are very on the forefront of my thoughts. Like, we have Amazon forests burning, we have governments that basically refuse to address the climate change in any way. Um, that fundamentally changes the way I do decisions, personally, about any platform of development. For example, if 10, 15 years ago you would ask me, um, I have a web, I have a Node.js server, or I have a server that generates a single page, and there's a lot, a lot of dynamic data on that page, and that dynamic data changes once a day. And you would tell me, is there, like, should I improve it? And I would say, well, you can put a cache on top of it, but if it costs you nothing to run it, and you can, like, you can respond to the load that it receives, keep it running. And now, I would actually try as hard as possible to avoid the necessary CPU cycles. I would try to make sure that I cache and don't do any double work, at least on my side, right? If you are bringing your Drupal instance, your own, your very own Drupal instance into your very own Docker container, into your very own environment, you are taking on managing and running that monster, right? And it doesn't run all the time. Sometimes it's idle, but even when it's idle, it still uses your CPU cycles and your memory. And you are in the ones who are interested in optimizing it because you have other business value to deliver. You have other features that you need to deliver for your organization. So you don't have time to spend half a year on optimizing the use and idle time on, this on that, both the software and the machine. You know who has that time? Contentful. Content, it's in Contentful's best financial interest to make sure that they, their idle time is as small as possible and they share as many resources as possible with as many people as possible. Use them. What it all means is that my general recommendation is off-the-shelf managed solutions should be a status quo of any software delivery. This is your starting point. You need a website, register squarespace.com account or wordpress.com account, choose off-the-shelf theme that they have, configure the custom, uh, the custom content structure in half an hour, onboard your stakeholder, you're done. You need a bit of a custom design, okay, register content for register or Prismic, create a static front end that connects to that content provider, push it on Netlify as eight now, you're done. You need a web shop, Register a Shopify or commerce layer account, create a static front end that connects to it, deploy it to Netlify or Zait now, you're done. You need to build a bunch of business logic that you can't quite find service for it. Well, you've just found your core domain. In other words, your core domain is a software as a service nobody yet provides. So think about it. It's like you have a problem or a need, and you look in the market and nobody else solved it. One of two things happened. Either your need is not real, or more likely, your need is real, but it's real and specific only for your business. You just found your core business domain. And your core domain is the only place where writing custom code or spending any time on your bespoke infrastructure actually makes sense. And your domain, your core domain, is usually smaller than you think at the beginning, but it's also more important than you think at the beginning. The hard truth is that we spend so much time resolving the existing problems that there is a backlog in every single organization of the problems that need solving that already have existing solutions on the market. Which means, as soon as you go down this route, it might take a while until you find your core domain, until you get to that problem that doesn't have a solution on the market. Which means, as a software engineer or as a provider within the organization, you will need to spend a bunch of time configuring UIs and clicking and drag and dropping through the WordPress.com or Squarespace. And that gets a very negative response from a lot of engineers that I interact with, obviously. And the response is along the lines, but I'm an engineer. My job is to deploy services onto the servers. And I counter that with, well, if your customer needs a way to post the news. Deploying a custom instance of a WordPress is probably the worst thing you can do in the world because that's the most expensive and the riskiest of all available options right now. 
I don't think our shared purpose is to deliver solutions. Our I think our shared purpose is to solve problems, despite what our CVs might say. But I do get the, the conflict, and I do see this in every single organization or a team that I work with. And the conflict is that although everybody hires engineers or builds an engineering team to solve particular ser sets of problems, we as an engineers quite often end up being paid to deliver solutions, right? Hired to solve problems, paid to deliver solutions. And that's what creates this you know, need to over-engineer a lot of the times. And I was thinking a lot about that, and I made a connection while I was researching on MRPs. So apparently there is something similar that happened after the MRPs failed. So let's go back in time one more time. We're going back straight after the MRPs failed, and as I said at the very beginning, majority of the factories moved to a greener pastures. Those greener pastures were called ERPs, which is Enterprise Resource Planning. The easiest way to think about it is MRP on steroids. Right? MRP was focusing just on the shopping floor of a factory. ERP focuses on everything in the factory. They focus on marketing. They focus on your uh, factory floor. They focus on everything that happens in the factory. And again, if you ask people that are selling uh, ERPs what is the main power, they will say, well, it covers all of the production and monitoring. And particularly people that are really good at selling ERP will, t will start telling you that their biggest advantage is that they can store gigabytes or terabytes of data, and they can transfer that data between branches of your organization or your business and to the, to the headquarters of your business. The perhaps most interesting thing is that to this day, if you ask majority of the people that implement ERP, what is the limitation that the ERP diminishes, a lot of them wouldn't tell you any reasonable answer. A lot of them will tell you that, well, transparency, visibility, we're using ERP because it brings a lot of visibility. The limitation ERP is actually supposed to diminish is that if you think about it, in every large organization, there's a lot of departments and there's quite often a case where department A or a manager of department A needs to make a decision and that decision is either impactful or highly dependent on department C in the other side of the country or in another country altogether. Now, without the software, without the visibility, you cannot possibly make those decisions in educated or data-driven way. So you end up making decisions without the relevant data or knowledge. And that's how a lot of the organizations operated on. So what rules help them survive be, not being able to make educated decisions? Well, there is, there is a local optimal rule, so-called for optimization for the local space. So, the way to think about it is this. As a department head or department manager, you can always make a decision within your department based on the knowledge and information available within your department and within your department alone. And if you, if you spread those decisions over a long enough period of time, on average, your decision making will be better than another department head who makes decisions totally at random. Right? But your decision making will still be way worse than a decision making of the, of the department head who actually made decisions based on the awareness of the entire organization. ERP provides information and awareness to every single department head so that we can replace the rule of op local optimal with a rule of global optimal where the department heads can start making decisions that benefit not just their department but the entire organization, but the entire factory. Right? And as you might guess, to this day, a lot of the organizations that implement ERP implement ERP in one room of the headquarters, hire a huge team of IT specialists that man that ERP system, and their department A head and department C head still make decisions in isolation with completely, complete lack of awareness of what's happening on the other side. Technology can bring benefit if and only if it diminishes a limitation. But hold on a second. There's an interesting aspect here. What is the main power of technology? It covers all of the factory production and monitoring. What is the main power of role? Well, that role covers all of the application delivery and monitoring. Local optima, just to give you more examples, is when 
in the factory, you have a marketing department that makes a decision that has huge impact on the factory floor without consulting or considering the impact on the factory floor. Local optima is when your shopping floor makes a decision that is directly linked to what's happening on the factory floor without considering what is actually happening in the factory floor. Local optima is when you have a backend developer that makes a decision about how the backend of the system should look without considering the implications on the front end. Local optima is when you have a DevOps, DevOps person that decides how the deployment of application should go and how the infrastructure should be structured without taking into account the delivery time and how the front end developers will deal with this. I just replaced ERP and, the, and technology with a full stack developer in a role. And I can expand now the rule that Eliyahu Goldrod provided us with my own version, which is technology or rule role can bring benefit if and only if it diminishes the limitation. And as a full stack developers, the limitation that the full stack developer diminishes is inability to make an end-to-end -end delivery decisions. And the kick is, you cannot possibly ma make effective end-to-end -end decisions if you need to learn five million elements in your stack. Full stack developer manages the entire stack by keeping it small. You cannot be a full stack developer if your full stack doesn't fit into your head. So saying you might not need blank is not only a title of the stock, but there are shared responsibilities as a full stack developers. And my, I implore you, implore you that don't just be a full stack developer. When you join a team, don't just try to learn every single aspect of the stack, every single piece of their stack, and own it. Compress it. Find ways of replacing parts of that stack with something that someone else will be responsible for managing and, and gratefully pay them money. It will be cheaper. Be a lesser stack developer. Look for ways of owning smaller stacks and delivering more value. Because our fundamental responsibility as full stack developers is to ensure that limitation is diminished. And our limitation is ability to make effective holistic decisions that are better for the entire end-to-end -end delivery of the application. And with so much tech that we're currently forced to manage, we can't possibly make those effective decisions. Full stack developer can only bring benefit if the stack is shrinking. Thank you for listening. Thank mm -hmm. you.